Hey, welcome back to uh, Zooming in on Revelation Week 3, Discovering Its Curious Numbers, Words, <clears throat> Places, and Things. And we'll get started right now. There may be other people fighting traffic or raindrops or things like that. Thanks for, for coming again. Um, as you know, this is a four-week class. The first week we focused in on numbers, their, their design in God's creation and His Word, and we saw the number 7 and 12 and 10 and 4 and 3 and 666, and then we discovered that not only did God have numbers in mind in creation and in the Word, but also there's spiritual significance behind those numbers. I mean, you could take that to a, a bad place where everything becomes numerical and you're like way off the deep end, but in just in general, I think we can take away some things from that. And then last week we talked about some words for all of you uh, English majors. Uh, and Greek majors. Maybe that would be a better way. To, or aspiring Greek majors. I think that would be even better. Um, and uh, the fascinating idea that some of the Greek words create and carry meanings that are not in our English words. The word love in English is one word. They have five words in Greek for that same one English word. And we talked about makarios being blessed by the life of the gods and Nike, the word for victory, and diadema, the little cloth that you wrap around your head when you win a race, and so on. So there's, we just scratched the surface there, but there's a lot of rich uh, study that you can do there. Um, and then tonight is about the map people. Like, these are guys. Well, there are probably some women who love geography, too. I'm not going to say be, be sexist about that, but okay, map people. All kinds of people from all places that love maps. How about that? You know, yeah. So I just, uh, I, yes, uh, send your letters to Ben Sobels <laughs> at cypresschurch.org. <laughs> and as you walked in, you, you should have picked up two handouts, two for the price of one. You should have gotten two maps, which you're going to be using, and you should have got one handout. If anybody didn't get those, they're back there. And then just another piece of housekeeping. We do have extra copies of the first week's uh, handout and the second week's handout over on that table on that side uh, for you to pick up on the way out. And, and just finally, uh, last week we kind of ran up to the end of the time period. This week I'm going to try to end maybe five, seven minutes early, ten minutes early. So if you have questions about any of the material from tonight or even last week or the week before, um, or whether, whether Purdue's going to win the NCAA college basketball <laughs> tournament, which is a lock, you can ask the questions. And so, anyway, there you go. Two announcements before we get started. I think you heard Pastor Ben tell you, if you're here Sunday, that we have the privilege of inviting a, a candidate for worship director this Sunday coming up. Her name is Haley Lopez. She comes from Southern California. Her brother, her, not her brother, her husband Chris plays awesome drums too. It's like a two for the price of one. So we're going to have her lead our worship service on Sunday morning and get to know her. And so please uh, make note of that and try to come if you can. Also, I know this is going to be a hard one. Spring forward. You are losing, you are losing an hour of sleep Saturday night. Just going to tell you, go to bed at eight <laughs> instead, of, instead of nine. Yeah, eight instead of nine. I know, <clears throat> you need your sleep. Um, because if you wake up Sunday morning, you're going to be one hour late for church. And we're going to be saying amen as you walk in the door. So I know. And I'm not going to call you. I'm just not going to do that. Okay, let me, uh, let me open us in a word of prayer. And then we'll get started with tonight's material. Lord, we thank you on this uh, rainy Wednesday evening here in the Central Coast that we can be gathered together as your people in this room to learn, to grow, to discover, and all of this leads to doxology, which is praise. And we're so privileged that we have this hunger inside of us to know you more and to know your word more and to dig deeper. And so that's a blessing. So we pray your presence is with us. We know it is. Um, give us enlightenment. Give us uh, fresh ideas and insight, in, insightful thoughts. And on our part, we'll give you all the praise. And everyone said, amen. amen. So we're going to be tag teaming this thing. Um, in one hand, you're going to be having your map. 
In the other hand, you're going to be having your hand out. Um, and let me just introdu introduce this idea uh, with a question. Why should we even bother studying with geography, studying about geography in this region? W who cares? I mean, what difference does it make? Are you, okay. I care. Because you care. Okay, because you care. Okay, that's good. I, that's a good answer. Um, I would not say that's a wrong answer. <laughs> But um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's because geography and the culture, we're, we're going to be getting eventually down to the seven cities of, of Revelation, uh, the seven churches. But um, Gordon Fee says it this way, like city, like church. And what he means by that statement is these seven locations are going to be different. They're going to be different in geography, in, in uh, topography, different in culture, different in history. And all of that is going to inform the lifestyle that the people in that place lead, which is going to inform how Jesus deals with them. So I think for that, for that reason and that reason mainly, we do want to study geography. So um, I want you to take a look on this map, on uh, this map that you have here. It's entitled The Roman Empire to its greatest extent. In uh, uh, 117 AD, and the, the red line around the outside is the border of the Roman Empire as it existed back then. In terms of its size, um, we have this verse in Luke uh, 2, verse 1. The decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And that, in that context, that word does not mean the planet or the cosmos, the universe. It means the world of the Roman Empire. That was the context. So it meant the borders in, within the red line is what it really meant. And so that was the Roman Empire that Caesar ruled, and, and you can see it here on, on your map. 2,700 miles roughly across, about 1,000 miles north to south, which is almost the exact size of the continental United States. So to give you an idea of size, you know, Spain would be the west coast, and over in the, 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 uh, the sea, the Caspian Sea, or whatever it is on the right-hand side, that would be the east coast, and up and down from the, the border with Canada down to Florida. So it's about that same uh, width across. Um, so that was, a, that was the, the world as the Romans defined it. They didn't care about the other parts of the world so much. Um, so that's that. Number two, Roman provinces. What is a Roman province? And the answer simply, uh, well, let me just read you the verse here. So here, this is a verse um, from Acts chapter 23 where the word province is used. And when they had come to Caesarea, so now Paul is under arrest in this context. He's leaving Jerusalem under the cover of night. They're going to take him out of there before he gets ripped to shreds. And so they go up to Caesarea on the coast, <clears throat> and they're delivering him to the governor and they're presenting Paul to the governor, and, and the governor's question is, well, what province are you from, Paul? So the word province is used there in Scripture. Come to find out, it is, as we say on the, on the handout, the Rome's basic unit of administration for the, empire, for the empire outside of Italy. So as you look on the map, you see all the different colored areas? Those are provinces. All the different... Uh, uh, all the different uh, provinces are there. I think there's 46 of them in total. And they each had a governor. And you can kind of think of, it, think of it like the United States. Each state has a governor, but we have a federal government also. It's, it's a little bit different in many ways, but, but that's kind of the idea of it. Um, and in, at John's time, there were 46 of them. So having said that, I want you to look at this map and tell me what you think that many of these names have in common. If you look at the names across that, the provinces, what do many of those names have in common? I-A I I at the end, correct. I-A or, or even the letter A at the end. Yeah, so you have Cappadocia, you have Bithynia, you have Asia, you have Galatia. Yeah, what does I-A mean? mean? It means land of or people of. So Galatia, Galatia was the land of the Gauls. Huh. 
Bithynia was the land of the Bithynies, whoever they were. Yeah, and Spain, Spain actually was Hispania, and Great Britain was Britannia. So they put this IA at the end to uh, indicate that this once was maybe a separate country, and now it's the, the people in this region that now are part of Rome's empire. So that's what that meant um, in those days. And you see that in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, there in the middle of the page. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. I think all of them, but Pontus, have IA at the very end of them. So here's the, here's the question. Of the, eight continent, of the eight continents in the world, how many end in A or IA? What are they? What are the seven continents? North America. North America, South America, Africa, Asia, yeah, Antarctica, Australia, and Europe, which is not an IA. So seven, uh, seven of the eight end in I or IA. Okay, so that's the first thing. Number two, how many countries in the world end in IA? You'll never guess, but how many do you think? If there's 195 countries, 38. Yeah, I know. Give me a name of a country that ends in IA. Romania. Romania. What else? Algeria, Armenia, Indonesia, Latvia, Liberia, Lithuania, Malaysia. Yeah, I've got a list here. 38 of them. 38 countries. End in IA. 21 of the, of the United States uh, states end in the letter A. And five of the states of the United States end in IA. Any guesses what the IAs are? California. California. Yes, sir. California. Yes, exactly. How about, if you, how about some other ones? Georgia. Pennsylvania. Virginia and West. Virginia, yeah, see? It's not gonna be on the final though. So, yeah, so, those, so that's kind of that idea that all these, aim, all these places were once countries that were governed by, by their own people until the Romans said, we want your country like right now. So they just moved in and said, yes, please, take it all. I mean, it's yours. So they, that's what they did and they, just, and they set this governor in there and the governor had a one year term a one-year term, and they were senators sent out from Rome. Okay, you're going over to Asia for one year. Just pack up your stuff and go. Why a one-year term? I don't know, but maybe it was because they didn't trust them. Yeah, exactly. They wanted to give them a short leash, like don't get too cozy with those people because you belong to Rome. And if they were written up, they could be in trouble back at headquarters. So. They had one-year terms, and uh, they went out there in the field. And so, so if, if, the, if the, uh, the basic unit of government for the Romans was the, um, was the province, what was the basic unit of government for God, geographically? Yes, for God's, for God's empire, for God's kingdom. And the answer is the city. You have the church in Jerusalem. You have the church in Rome. You have the church in Corinth. You have the church in Ephesus. So the basic unit of God's administration is the church, the local church. And you might have a fellowship here and a fellowship there and a fellowship here. So in, in Salinas and in, in Monterey, we probably have 100 churches. But we're all one fellowship in the city of whatever the city is. Anyway, thought that would be interesting to you. Finally, Roman tools and governance. How did they govern the empire? Finances, law, and military. I want you to pay taxes and they're gonna be exorbitant so that we'll make you poor, <laughs> so that you will obey. Number two, we got the law and it's gonna be rigid. And if that doesn't work, we're sending in the, the troops, yeah. Okay, there you go, page two and map two. I know, you gotta be ambidextrous. Page two, map two, now we're zooming in closer. 
And I call this the Mediterranean region. Um, it's the map's name is St. Paul's First and Second Journeys. And you see in the upper right-hand quadrant of the page what we would know as Asia Minor. Asia Minor. When you think of Asia, you think what? China, mm -hmm. India, you know, Indonesia. You know, yeah. But in those days, you know, they, they didn't go very far afield. And so the western part of this, what is now today's Turkey, is called Asia Minor. They thought Asia means east. That's what it actually means. So back in the day, that was east until they found out, well, there's even more east out there. So the Asia became Asia Major, <clears throat> and th these guys became Asia Minor. I don't know how, if they felt bad about that or not, but that was basically what it was. Um, so it's a place called Anatolia. If you want to get technical, uh, in today's Turkey, it includes... I mean, if you look on the map, you can go right all the way across to the right-hand border there. That's pretty much it. Or on this map, this, this is the today's map of Turkey, which shows the, the same thing. And you see the different provinces in different colors there. Asia would have been the yellow one. And then you have um, Galatia in the green there, Cappadocia in the orange, Cilicia, all those different provinces of Asia Minor. Um, so, uh, yeah, where are we? Yeah, uh, so on your handout, Asia Minor, we just tell you the same thing that I just told you without going to, to, the, uh, uh, to the handout, but there it is right there. The names of the seven provinces in Asia Minor in the center of the, pa of the, center of the page notice that, uh, how they all end Asia, which meant sunrise, the east, where it was coming from, Lycia, Pamphylia, Galatia, Bithynia, and Pontus. For whatever reason, Bithynia and Pontus were always included together. Uh, maybe they were one at one time. Pontus literally means Black Sea. I thought that was interesting. Cappadocia means beautiful horses. So what do you think you would find in Cappadocia? <laughs> beautiful horses, yeah. Cilicia, Paul's home province. So he, he lived there. He came from the town of, of Tarsus. Um, so I have, you, I have you, this map on the back there where we see this kind of, this layout of, of the uh, country of Turkey, but but the map really doesn't do the country justice because if you look at the country, you really can't tell much about the elevation, can you? Yeah, or even looking at your, the map that I handed out there. But if you look at a topographic map, something comes out. What is it? Serious mountains. Now you go, wow. So if Paul is leaving, you see, Paul's down here. This is Israel down here. He's leaving. He's going to be walking across this place. He's got to go up the mountains. And the average is, is uh, three to 4,000 feet. Mount Ararat, 17,000 feet. That's a little bit further, farther north than this site. So now you start getting an idea of the, of the lay of the land there, and it kind of informs your thoughts about Paul walking all this way over to Asia. And he would have... Uh, yeah, he would have gone up here through these mountains, maybe around here, and ended up over here in Ephesus. Um, and so that's really a, that's really a hike. Here's a, here's a verse that I found. I, I mean, this just popped out at me, having never known this before. Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus, Acts 19.1. He passed through the upper country. <laughs> Like, that was in the Bible. I never saw that before yesterday. Well, so much is in the Bible that we never see. So I think that's really kind of interesting. Um, down at the, the page two near the bottom, the province of Asia. Of course, you see that immediately when you read the book of Revelation. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you. And then you have some of the details down there. The interesting one of those details is that this region, Asia, was the most, uh, the richest region in the whole uh, Asia Minor. All the wealth, much of the wealth was uh, centered there, much of the population also. Um, and it constituted the most enthusiastic supporters of emperor worship. Like, we are just in, 100%. So what's that going to mean for the Christians? Not going to be good, not going to be good at all. Yeah, so that's, um, that's something you can take away from this. Let me show you one more slide. What do you notice in this slide? Here are your seven churches in Asia. 
Does anything stand out to anybody? They're all in the low country. Yes. And I didn't even pay you your $10. So yeah, they're all in the low country. Why? Water in the rivers. They wanted to be beside the rivers. And some of the, some of the, yeah, and, and of course, Ephesus on the seacoast, Smyrna on the seacoast, Pergamum inland, and so forth. So that's going to become an important part of, uh, of looking at what happens in all of these uh, different places. The, the, the little um, temple at the bottom of page two is a temple to the emperor. Not so sure which emperor this was, but that's what they did. They set up these temples and they worshiped them as gods, whether they were actually in residence or not. Page three of your handout. Now we're going to go through the seven churches one by one. We're going to look at the geography. We're going to look at some of the cultural aspects, and hopefully that will help us get a background for understanding Revelation better. So now this is the audience participation part. You have a pen. You take out your pen. I want you to, so the first page on page three is Ephesus. Circle Ephesus. I know, this is the advanced class. Circle <laughs> Ephesus. Yes. It's down at the bottom. Do you see it? Yeah. If you don't have a pen, we have pens all over the place here. So, Ephesus, the greatest metropolis of Asia. It's the New York City. It is the biggest place. They think that at the time of uh, John, his writings, there were 400,000 people living in Ephesus at that time. All of the major roads that went north, south, east, or west came to a head in Ephesus. It was the major seaport for going to Rome. The governor had his residence in Ephesus, so you had his presence there. Um, so that's, the, that's a couple of the interesting facts of it. Up, in the, up in the, to the right of the map, a port on the Aegean Sea to the mouth, uh, the mouth of the Caister River, sloping hills. So now you're at the seacoast, you have these gradually sloping hills. You've got the Mediterranean climate coming in. It's really cool air most of the time. And it's in, it, today it's called the city of Kushidasi. And if you go on a trip to Turkey to go to see John's um, churches, we did that in 2008, was it? 2007, one of those two. Anyway, we, we went to, the, to Greece first and then over to Turkey. We went to all these different places, but um, it's a very, a very big place now. Um, at the top of, pay, of the page, you have this word beside Ephesus. What's the word? What does that mean? Yes, they change a lot. Why would Ephesus change? Hmm? Yes, exactly. Exposure to other cultures. So people are coming in from the west. They're coming in from the east. The culture is moving. It's changing all the time. Not only that, they had a serious problem with silt in the river. And so the, the, all the, the water would come down and it would silt up the harbor. So they were continually dredging the harbor, trying to stay one day ahead of the devil, just getting that stuff out of there so the port wouldn't close. And today when you go to Kushidasi, when you go to the site there, it's six miles from the ocean. And that's all the silt that built up over all the generations. So that's change. So when you think about Ephesus, think about change. You lost your first love. I mean, it's about change. That's really interesting. Also, there's a center of Christian work down at the bottom of page three. Priscilla and Aquila were dropped off there by the Apostle Paul in chapter 18 of Acts. He said, you guys stay here. I'll come back and visit you later. So they did. And for all we know, they started the church in Ephesus back in the day. And then Paul uh, went there um, and stayed almost three years in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 and taught in a school. And then you have Timothy, um, who is going to be staying there temporarily after Paul gets out of prison. Paul and Timothy go to town, and Paul says, I gotta go, could you just stay here? And Timothy says, when are you coming back? He says, right away. It was a year later, like, really? So yeah, he stayed there a year in Paul's absence. And legend has it that the apostle John took Mary there. So I don't know if you remember this, um, in John 19, 
John is the only apostle standing at the cross. Peter, the rest of them have run for cover. They are like miles away. John is standing at the cross and Mary, Jesus' mother, standing there with him. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. He said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So, so tradition has it that in A.D. 70, when the Romans invaded um, Jerusalem and destroyed it because they were causing riots, John said, we're out. And so he takes Mary and he goes to Ephesus. So at the bottom of page 3, you see that timeline. A.D. 30 was the time that Jesus was crucified. A.D. 70 is when they left for Ephesus. So he was there almost 30 years, 25 years before Revelation was written. Okay, so there you have that. Other things there, um, the, the, you could read this on your own. It was the guardian city of the goddess Artemis. So you can read about that in Acts chapter 19. Um, and so anyway, there was, there was, a, there was a lot of, of fervent uh, goddess lovers in that city. Page four. Our second city is Smyrna. So take out your pen and circle Smyrna. This is, this is the easy part. Yeah. It was considered the loveliest city in Asia. It sat on hills, beautiful hills that kind of formed a crown, if you will, uh, and that's what they called it, the, 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 uh, the crown city. It was a rival of Ephesus. So these three cities, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, they were in a, in a contest of who could be the most beloved city in the Roman Empire. So they were always fighting against each other by building more and more temples and who can outdo each other, who can, who can uh, win the governor's attention and so on. The Crown of Asia, you can see that, a great trading center. Uh, it had the largest theater in Asia, for whatever that means. I don't think it's there anymore. And the birthplace of Homer. How about that? Population about 200,000 at John's time, about half the size of Ephesus, and the only city of the seven that's still in existence. How about that? Yeah, and you go there today, it's a, it's a city called Izmir. It's a modern city. You know what the population of Izmir is today? 4.5 million. 4.5 million people live in Izmir, Turkey, where... Um, the city of Smyrna once was. What's the, what's the word uh, of, that, uh, of that town? Faithfulness in two ways. The crazy people were faithful to their gods, to a, to a fault. And what about the Christians? Yeah, the advice that Jesus gives them is, be faithful unto death, you'll get the crown of life. So faithfulness is the key word of Smyrna. The word Smyrna comes from the word myrrh. What is myrrh? It's a spice, and it has the symbolism in the Bible of death because they, they, um, um, they put ointment with myrrh in it on dead bodies to kind of anoint them. So myrrh in some, some symbolism in passages in the New Testament also applies to the idea of, of, of death. Uh, okay, I did the, that. Um, exceptionally difficult to be a Christian in Smyrna. You can understand that, can't you? Leading city of emperor worship. There was a temple to the emperor Tiberius there. The first city in the world to build a temple to the goddess Roma. And finally, a large resident Jewish population that was strongly anti-Christian. And they call, you know what they called the Christians? In Smyrna, atheists, because they didn't believe in the gods. They were atheists. <laughs> well, they were they weren't atheists. They were the real theists, but they called but the people called them you atheists. You got to believe in the god. Isn't that kind of funny? That's kind of like a reverse thing. So why did I put a wine press at the bottom? What the, what's the picture of wine press mean? Yes, and I, di I didn't get a picture of a big rock, like Pastor Ben said, sitting on your chest. <laughs> Couldn't find that picture, but this is my closest one. The, the pressure is ratcheting up on these poor 
Christians in the town and they're suffering under the pressure. I know your tribulation and your poverty. Don't fear what you're about to suffer. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. So the second city is Smyrna. Page five. Circle the word Pergamum at the top. I know, this is part of the learning process. What's the word for Pergamum? Yes. This was the oldest and most authoritative city in Asia. They had the longest. The king of Pergamum goes back the, the, further, the furthest than any, any of the other kings of the region. 75 miles north of Smyrna, three miles north of, of the Caius River. It wasn't right on the river. It was on a high hill, like this, the Acropolis up there. That's where they built the, the, um, the city. Uh, it was called the Royal City because it had this kind of regal appearance on the hill with all these different buildings up there. There were temples. It looked like a crown of sorts. So they got the name Royal City also because it was where the, the, the king of Pergamum lived for all those years. So I think that was uh, informative. The historical capital of the promise, province, you see that there, had the greatest library. That's a factoid. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but, but it really, it was the biggest library outside of Alexandria, Egypt, which was the biggest one in the world. And the story goes that in Egypt, they make the paper out of papyrus which is a vegetable product from reeds. They take reeds and they strip them down into little, uh, little strips and they press them and they, they make paper out of them. But um, they didn't make paper. They didn't have paper in uh, Pergamum, so they, you know what? They invented parchment there. Parchment is a skin of an animal stretched. And so you have animal life, vegetable life. And there was, there was this rumor or this legend, it's probably not true, that there was a war between these two libraries and that Egypt wasn't giving up any of their, of their papyrus. And they said, well, we'll just show you. And so they made parchment. And so that's how that whole thing played out. I don't know. We're going to have to ask somebody sometime. But I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, they, they, the word parchment means comes from the word Pergamum. So that's where that word actually comes from. And here, you never knew this before you walked in tonight. This was the Mayo Clinic of the ancient world. Huh. Pergamum, the Mayo Clinic of the ancient world. They venerated the god Asclepius, who was the god of healing. And these gods were fictitious, of course, they're mythological. But uh, that was his emblem. And look at the emblem at the bottom. His, his, uh, his emblem had a snake in it. To today, this is the emblem of medicine. <laughs> Snakes on this thing that's winged. And it comes from Greek mythology from years and years ago. And so in Pergamum, they had all these spas where they lay out all these people and doing all this bloodletting and things that we would never, ever do in a million years. But that was the idea that they had all of these different therapies for people who were sick. So people came from all over the world. And so as the, as the mythology goes, um, Escapulus had five daughters, and each of them, each, the name of each one represents a different branch of medicine. And one of the daughters' name was Hygieia, <laughs> which is where we get the word hygiene. She was the goddess of health and happiness. <laughs> Brush your teeth and wash your hands, and you'll be healthy and happy. Panacea, her sister, was the goddess of universal remedy, the panacea. We're going to solve everything in one fell swoop. So uh, that's that, and that's interesting. Um, and because Pergamum was a religious center, it had more temples to the gods than anybody else. And so scholars think maybe that's why Jesus uh, said that Satan's throne was there, because there was such a concentration of uh, the, the evil forces in that, uh, in that particular city. Page number six. Wow, we're tracking. This is like a fast class. Thyatira. What does Thyatira's, what is Thyatira's word? 
Yeah, circle, circle, Thyatira. Circle, Thyatira. 80, uh, 52 miles northeast of Smyrna, lies at the mouth of a long open valley near the Hermas and Calamus rivers, a garrison outpost on an unprotected plain. Okay, military people. A garrison outpost on an unprotected plain. I mean, they're not up on the hill. They're not on a rock. They're not fortified. They're in the middle of nowhere as an outpost. So they had strong walls. But the problem was the enemy could just go around. Thank you very much. We'll see you later. And so, you know, what good was that? Just absolutely no good at all. So they could slow the enemy down but they couldn't really defeat anybody. And they were, they were there to protect Pergamum from getting invaded. So um, an elite Roman guard was stationed there. It was the least known, least important, and least remembered city in Asia. What a reputation that would be. The least known, the least important, the least remembered city in Asia. But they were on a very high trafficked road, a trade road that went through there. So. They developed a great trade industry, all the trades and crafts. And uh, you see in the middle of page six there, a vibrant commercial society. They had guilds. What is a guild? Anybody know what a guild is? Like a union, yeah, that's exactly right. Here was one definition of a guild. A guild is an association of craftsmen and merchants formed to, pr to promote the economic interests of the members and provide protection and mutual aid. Yeah, so you had all of the different bakers and potters and tanners and weavers and dyers and brass workers, and there's probably 20 more. It was a town of, it was a guild, a town of the guilds. Um, the, the dark side of that was the guilds were pretty raw. They, they, they would have festivals that you were supposed to attend. If you remember the guild, you, you have to attend these things, and it was, awful immorality going on and drunkenness and and at the end you'd be worshiping the gods and so that posed a serious problem to the Christians yeah what, what are you going to do you're you're going to be a tanner in town and they say we're having a guild meeting on Friday you need to be there but in the meeting itself you're going to be exposed to idolatry and immorality man that would have given you serious um, cause for pause so that was difficult for uh, the Christians in that city. It became famous in the New Testament of all places in Philippi, which is miles away in Greece, when Lydia, the seller of purple, shows up in Philippi in the morning, that, that just the morning after Paul goes there, they go down by the riverside, and Lydia's there, and she was the sales rep for the dyer industry, the dyer's industry in, in, in Thyatira. She probably had business cards. <laughs> she shows up in town, and she was, she, purple was her color. She's selling purple dye, she's selling purple goods, she's selling purple, I mean, she probably had a, you know, a, a book to write down her orders and stuff. She gets saved. She becomes one of the foundational people in um, Philippi. You could read about Lydia in Acts chapter 17. Um, why why this, this verse in Revelation 2, 18 at the bottom of the page? The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Why that? Any, any guesses on that? Well, if you're compromising, you need purified. I think that's the main thing that I can see exactly what you're doing. We're not doing that anymore. So I think that was, we're going to find out when we go through um, Thyatira in a few weeks, but I think that's probably one of the good reasons, one of the reasons why that. Um, okay, page number seven. I think we're going to make it. Yeah. Sardis. You want to circle Sardis. It's kind of in the middle of the map. Sardis, 35 miles southeast of Thyatira, on a military trade route on the, uh, on the Pactolus River in the Hermes Valley. Doesn't mean anything to you. Capital of the kingdom of, of uh, Lycia, center of the carpet industry. Wow, 
That's interesting. I, that's worth some digging. It, here's, a, here's the quote. It was the greatest example of the deconstruction of a city from its past splendor to its present decay anywhere. The greatest example of the deconstruction, that's not on your page, the greatest example of the deconstruction of a city from its past splendor to its present decay anywhere. So this, this city went down. Yeah, so you have the city that had legendary wealth. You pronounce this king's name Croesus. He was the greatest king of Sardis. And he was also the richest man in the world. And he accumulated his great wealth by finding gold. And everything he turned, touched, that he touched turned into gold. He had the Midas touch, if we could say that. Um, coins, gold coins, were first minted in Sardis. Um, and they became a society of smug overconfidence. We got the wealth. We got everything we need. We don't need nothing. I mean, that's kind of how they were. Uh, and so they had this reputation. He had that reputation. Um, they also were on, on a 1,500-foot high plateau that had vertical stone rock walls. It was impenetrable. When you're coming in there to try to attack them, you have no way. You're not going to get up the walls. There's no way to get around it. And so he kind of thumbed his nose at the great Persians that had millions of soldiers. And uh, as a result, he got in trouble because they found a way up around the back. I think they tortured somebody and they, they said, okay, I'll tell you. So they went around, you just go around the back and you go up and, and they did. And so these, they found the soldiers that were supposed to be guarding the citadel asleep. And there's a picture of a sleeping soldier. They were so cocky and so overconfident that they were asleep at the switch. They were just immediately destroyed by the Persians. And that happened not only once, but twice. Yeah, after, you know, years later, centuries later, they switched allegiances and they did it again. So I think this is the, the idea, careless confidence, which is never going to be a good thing. So here's the verse. Get, I love this verse, Revelation 3. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. If you will not wake up, I'm going to come to you as a thief. You're not going to know what hour I will come to you uh, against you. That's exactly what happened to the military that lived in the city of Sardis, the city of careless confidence. If we had time, we could, go, we could do a message on each one of these, just picking up the main word. But tonight, we're just giving you a taste of what you can see when we go through the rest of Revelation. Philadelphia, page 8. Yeah, circle Philadelphia, I know. Circle Philadelphia on the map. It's going to help, it really is. 26 miles southeast of Sardis, it, uh, it was like a Greek outpost. It was further out. It was like on the fringe out there on a very important military road, a beautiful valley near a river. It was the youngest of the seven cities. It was like a transplant. It was like a, like, not like a church plant, but it was a plant. They just planted this uh, group of people out there. Uh, there's a Greek city nearby called Alaseu. It's not exactly the place. It's about 10,000, maybe 100,000 people living there right now. When we went there on our bus tour, there's nothing left except these two big arches. I don't know if you remember this, the big arches. Then there's a garden. It was a Byzantine uh, set of arches, so it really didn't get down excavated down to the Roman period, but uh, so there's nothing so much to see there. A fortress city, on another one on a broad, unprotected, unprotected plain, but they tried to, to slow down the enemy from attacking them. It was a city of brotherly love. Have you heard this? Yes, yes everybody knows that. Why is that? What's the word, what does the word Philadelphia mean? Brotherly love, of course. Philos, friendly fondness, Adelphos, brother. But what you didn't know, it was actually named for two brothers who had a fondness for each other in a good way. Okay? They were just really good, close brothers. And there they are, Adelus II and 
uh, Eumenes, these two brothers, and they, they were just really great friends, not only brothers, um, and so there you have it. The church in Philadelphia continued much longer than any other church through the 13th century, and um, it's one of the churches that Jesus has no criticism of. Just a lot of praise for. And here's something you did not know. It's the, it was the Napa Valley of the ancient world. Yeah, they were on a great volcanic plain. They had rich soil, so they grew grapes there. It was a wine-producing center. Um, but the downside was they built the city on a fault. It sounds like San Francisco, right? The Bay Area. Yeah, it's, it's on a fault, and there was a lot of volcanic activity, so they had daily tremors. Like, I don't know. I would not live there. It's like today's Oklahoma. Like, you've got tremors everywhere. But there's, the, so they had, they had that, that circumstance, and the city was destroyed a number of times because of that. I wonder why, in Revelation 3.11, I wonder if, if that's the reason why Jesus says, hold fast. <laughs> hold fast to what you have so that no one may take your Stephanos. That was last week. Remember we said Stephanos is not a crown, it's a wreath, just like the picture there. Hold, it's a victory wreath that you want to hold on to. So Philadelphia is the uh, sixth of the churches. I think we're going to make it. Which leaves us only one left, and that's Laodicea. What's the word for Laodicea? Insolence. I don't know that I know a definition of insolence. What would you say the definition of insolent? Arrogance. Yeah, yeah? is that clo uh, close enough? Arrogance. Yeah. 35 miles southeast of Philadelphia, it's kind of right across from Ephesus. It was at a crossroads of two major trade routes there, again in a valley that it was called, a river was called the Meander River. Yeah, and if you look at the Meander River, what is it doing? It is meandering everywhere. Yeah, they were proud, proud, and proud again. They were proud of their gold. They were the Swiss bankers of antiquity. People would bring their money there and store it there. They were proud of their clothing. They were dominated by the black wool garment industry. It was this very fine black wool, glossy, that was made into garments, beautiful. And they were proud of their medicine. There was a medical school there at John's time, and they made eye salve. They made eye salve at this medical school, and people would come in that had eye problems to get the eye salve. But it was a city of lukewarm water. Why was that? And so you see on the map there, you have, you can see it on both sides, it's the same map. Hierapolis is, it, is kind of north. And then, then you have Laodicea down south. There's about 12 miles there. And then you have Colossae over here on, to the east of Laodicea. And that's another 12 miles. This is mountains down here. And the river is going right through the valley. So, and it's coming right down from the mountains. So Colossae had this beautiful mountain spring water, you know, that they're bottling today. But you, you had this beautiful cold spring water in Hierapolis is the city of hot springs. And you can go there today and you can get a bath in the hot spring. And we stayed in a hotel that was built right next to the hot springs. And we went in there and it kind of smells like sulfur in there. Um, but it was fun, we, we went in there, but it's very, very hot. So you have both of those two and, and Laodicea is in the middle of them. It was neither hot nor cold, it was lukewarm. So what's Jesus gonna do? Spit them out, and uh, yeah, I think what we're going to find when, when Pastor Ben hits Laodicea, I think we're going to find out that cold is not necessarily bad. So you think of hot and cold, you think, oh, hot, you got to be hot for Jesus, you want to be cold, you know, frigid. I don't, I don't think that that's what it means here. I think both have aspects that are, that are good characteristics. Hot could be you're on fire, cold could be something that's refreshing or cool, or level-headed or something, I don't know. But you don't want to be in the middle. They had to pipe the, wa the water in there, and by the time it got there, yeah, it's like everybody took their shower before you. <laughs> and it was just not gonna happen. So what does Jesus say in Revelation 3.18? I love this. 
I counsel you to fix these three pride problems. I counsel you to buy from me gold and white garments, not the black ones, and eye salve to anoint your eyes. This is an example of how, like city, like church, affects the meanings that we get out of uh, Revelation. And let me just end with page 10. Of course, we can't end without talking about the island of Patmos. It was a barren, rocky, little island, 34 miles out into the ocean, into the Aegean Sea. You can, you can barely see it here, right down in the corner. There it is. You got the most in Patmos. Maybe you can't see that, but, but that's, where, that's where it is, down there, off the coast. And uh, it was a Roman penal colony. The Romans were famous for dumping their political prisoners, especially the political ones, out on the, the survivor island and, you know, and just leaving them out there. Um, and John says in, in verse uh, 9 of chapter 1, I, John, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was preaching the gospel, and I was talking a lot about Jesus, and they didn't like it. And so I was arrested and thrown to the island, and, I, I'm, and that's where he was, of course, when Jesus gave him the revelation uh, message. So he was out there. The education of John on Patmos. How about that? What did John learn? What did he learn out there? Well, we're going to have to ask, but John was clearly physically separated. So for the last 25 years, he lived in Ephesus, and he had that circle of churches, probably the same ones, maybe others. And he would, he would go on a tour. He'd minister to them. He'd write letters to them. They were his churches, if you will, for 25 years. And so he, now he's separated from them. So all oh, what could he do? Pray. He could pray. Couldn't send them text messages. Couldn't send them anything. No. So he could just be there. Uh, clearly, he was in contact with Jesus and vice versa. And then tr uh, legend has it then that the emperor Domitian, the Roman emperor uh, had, who had put him out there on the island, was assassinated. And right after he was assassinated, the emperor Trajan um, came and released him. And tr tradition says he went back to Ephesus. Here, here's a... Here's a paragraph. It's traditionally believed that John was the youngest of the apostles and survived all of them. He is said to have lived to a, an old age, dying of natural causes at Ephesus sometime after 80, 98 AD during the reign of Trajan, thus becoming the only, possible, uh, the only apostle who did not die as a martyr. We don't know. We don't know. That's tradition. We don't know that. We're going to have to ask, like, John... How did that actually play out? We're just interested in knowing that. So, so this, is the, this is the geography. This is like the 45-minute the version of, of the geography here. We've talked about Roman provinces, what they were. They're on those maps. You can take those home and study them. We talked about the upper country coming down to the seashore. When we've looked at the culture of each of these cities, which kind of informs. So as you study now, Try to bring in some of these ideas to your study to see how these cultural, topographical, geographical elements might inform the inspiration that you get from reading Revelation yourself. We still have some time left, and we, just can, we can just open it up to people who might have questions. And, and do not try to stump the teacher, I know. <laughs> Which won't be hard. It won't be hard. <laughs> but you have, a, you have a question, Brian? That's possible. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's both and, because sometimes you have that, that happening, where it comes out of it comes out of a Jewish context and also comes out of a Greek context. There's many things like that. That could be. But I, in, in what 
in the books that I've read that are commentaries, they kind of point to the Greek, the Greek source. Yeah, but that's good. Yes. Could you help orient me? So in the beginning, um, they took Paul, um, or John, uh, across the, the very high mountainous regions and down into Patmos. No, they, they, they loaded him on, they arrested him here, uh -huh. put him on a ship, uh -huh. took him out, dumped him off. Okay. It's an island. Yeah. Because I'm not seeing it anywhere in here. Right? You're seeing it on page 10. It's the, it's the red thing there. And then at the bottom of page 10, you have... A, bottom of page 10, that thing looks like a dragon head is the actual outline of the island. When we were on tour, they took us out there. And uh, the Catholic Church, God bless them, they build, temp they build churches on everything. But they built a, a church right on top of the cave where John was supposed to have received the revelation. So it's a Sunday and we're there and we're tourists. And so we're lining up and we're gonna go down into the cave. And we go down into the cave, they're holding mass. And I felt, oh, we're interrupting their service. This is not good. So we just all walked around the outside of these people and outside and back up the stairs and we could see the whole thing. But yeah, it's a, you could see the island out there. It's really interesting. Other questions? Were you going to say something? Well, I was just going to say, I happened to be Googling the medical symbol when you were talking about Oh, we're fact-checking. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, it, it, it's, um, it says it's from Greece. So. <laughs> <laughs> I dodged that one. So, there's also a like second caduceus that only has one snake. Yeah. Okay. That is from um, the Pharisee. Okay, good. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> no more questions. <laughs> I thought I heard you say that Smyrna was the only only city that is still in existence today or only church. There's no churches in existence today. Yeah, because it's all mostly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. our, and you said Ephesus is called something else. So that's Ephesus is Kasha, yeah. The, but, the, but the original, yeah, the original ruins aren't there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ephesus has some, well, they have some ruins that you can go see. Yes, they're six miles out of town now, so they're still there. But, um, Yeah. Yes, there, okay, that's, I think that we're probably talking about um, Sardis. Kusadashi, Turkey, they had changed the name for that one, yeah. Yeah, and so there, there is a city still on that, on that property, yeah. 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 A lot of them are made out of silk. Yeah, we were taken to a uh, we were taken to a carpet factory in Kushidasi, and they make them out of they have hundreds of silkworms that spin these cocoons, right? And then they pull the fabric out of them and and make these beautiful carpets. Of course, they were trying to sell them to us, but um, yeah, they were gorgeous. So I don't know if that was. Um, that was in that other city that was the carpet center, what they made them out of, I'm not sure. Okay, next week, so now we've done numbers, words, places, and things. What is a thing? It's a, some kind of an object. It's going to be an object. So we're going to pick out maybe 10 objects that are unique to Revelation, okay? Okay, thank you very much. You. See you next week.